This is Sean Johnson with Premier Sports Officials Association uh, bringing you training tape week one of NFHS high school football. Uh, we have 20 clips here, and really last week's focus was make it big. This week's focus is mechanics and signals, and we're going to focus on things that aren't always taught in the mechanics manual, aren't always taught in introductory courses. Um, we have a couple judgment, and we have two penalty enforcement plays. Um, so we hope you enjoy it. So let's take a look at uh, clip number one. Good job by the umpire, pass play, walking up um, to the line of scrimmage to rule on illegal forward pass. And the first comment here, here is the headlinesman. Good job staying behind the play for your safety. Because as officials, if we're safe, we're going to be able to officiate a lot more efficiently. A lot to judge here. Location of Ford progress and bounds. Was he driven out of bounds backwards or sideways so we keep the clock running? Um, also, um, late hit out of bounds. If we're right on top of it and our safety is a concern, we're not really worried about officiating, but um, we're worried about our safety. So good job staying back. So we're in a good position to rule on a lot of stuff on a tough play. All right, so positive gain near the sideline. You're going to see the back judge come screaming in here to get that ball. Again, as we said, that headlinesman and line judge, they have a lot going on when there's a play in the sideline. Back judge, be active. You're getting that ball from the ball carrier from a positive gain and getting it to the umpire. And the last one, opposite official, every single time, even though you don't have anybody near you, accordion in at least to the numbers. All right, you're active, you're engaged. People in the press box could see where that spot is. So good job by the crew of uh, moving on that play before, during, and after. Clip number two, we have a field goal. Before the game, line of scrimmage officials, introduce yourself to the ball personnel. Get their names. Don't just yell ball. You know, if their name is Sean, Sean, ball. They will respond a lot better. But we train them to, on a field goal, put that kicking ball underneath the field goal post. Then go, they could go and catch the field goal. And we have a ball ready to go uh, for the kickoff. Referee in Federation, it's an untimed down. We do the circle above our head to signal untimed down to the clock keeper. So we have 7.54 here. After the field goal, make sure it is still 7.54. Signal rolling of the arms on a field goal attempt or fourth down and they're in scrimmage kick formation. That is reminding the defense and ourselves as, as officials the snapper has protection. On a PAT field goal and scrimmage kick, it's better coming from the referee because the referee is going to see the holder's knee down. The referee is going to see that uh, kicker 10 yards back on a field goal, the holder 7 yards back. So the referee should give it first, then mirrored by the umpire and both sounding snapper protection. So the defense does not go straight into the snapper. As this plays out, because it's a point after attempt, referee, you are blowing your whistle as soon as that ball is kicked. Remember, high school rules, the defense cannot score on a block PAT field goal attempt. Football is an emotional game. All right, so we have two players pushing, shoving a little bit after the play. We have to have a good feel for the game. Um, have these players had previous history? Were there warnings? Is it going to escalate? Or are there things we could do to de-escalate? So we have a shove. We have three officials coming in, feeling the temperature of the room, and the crew felt it was not necessary to ha have a flag in this moment of the game. Um, I, I will say the crew did a very good job dead ball officiating, and there was no escalation between those players throughout this game. So the decision of not throwing the flag here 
and just dead ball officiating, using presence, using voice, did what we needed to do to keep the game under control. Good job there. After field goals, there's going to be another clip that shows this a little bit better. We see a lot of officials run up the middle of the field. Avoid that. Run outside the pylon on both sides, up the sideline. It looks sharp, and you make yourself approachable for the coaches if they do have a question from the previous series. All right, we're snapping at the 825 position five. Umpires. Literally, the football field is a gridiron. So we have two down indicators, one for the down, one for the position. Another thing I've heard officials do is they say 255, which is yard line 25, position 5, just like a gridiron. Uh, find what works best for you so you remember the previous spot for plays like this. So we have a receiver not playing the ball, making early contact. We have defensive pass interference. So the flag is going to come out here, position number one. We all know defensive pass interference is 15 yards from the previous spot. It is not an automatic first down in high school. Um, this one resulted in a first down because it was first and 10, and the crew did a great job going back to position five, the position on the hash mark far, farthest from the press box to enforce that 15 yard penalty. So always important to remember where was the previous spot, not just yard line, but position. All right, so we get the question a lot. As an H or an L, where do I go? Do I go behind the ball carrier or do I go in front of the ball carrier? There's not one correct answer for every single situation. You have to feel the play. So the ball carrier right now is well behind the H. He's going to choose to go forward because that is the safest place to go to keep himself safe. All right, so now our forward progress was stopped inbounds this is good nfhs mechanics to hold up your arm and indicate what's the next number of down so that clock operator is going to keep that clock running because we only give them two signals either stop the clock or the arm up with the next number down and they know to keep the clock running in this type of situation uh, remember when the back judge came screaming in for a gain to the sideline now we have a loss to the sideline this is where the referee gets involved all right so if it's a loss to the sideline referee you're going to get the ball from the ball carrier this is also important this was the quarterback who went into the sideline referees always follow the quarterback into the sidelines as well so again great dead ball officiating and great ball mechanics by the crew all right so we train both ball boys to put the ball underneath the field goal post excellent job by both line of scrimmage officials if you feel like your high school game is going too long, this is the part of the game we typically allow the teams too much time. So the signal is up, the whistle is blown, this is when the 60 second interval starts. So now both teams are able to go to their sideline, get water, kickoff return, kickoff team, um, is going to have 60 seconds before they're ready for play whistle. So as officials, how do we make sure it's 60 seconds? Watch the hustle on this back judge. All right, he's going to be going to the outside part of that pylon, coming up the sideline, because he has to be in position to come onto the field with 45 seconds left. That's the funny whistle. It's a lot quicker than most people think. Um, so back judges, especially if it's a high-scoring game, be ready to run, but we need to keep that 60-second interval after a scoring play. All right, is it a safety or is it not a safety? I'm not worried about the judgment. The quality of film isn't great. We can't do that big, huge zoom in. But we need to remember the whole entire ball has to be outside of that end zone to rule it out of the end zone. If that point of that ball is still touching that goal line, just like if we were going to score a touchdown, the result of the play is a safety. 
So when determining safety or not, you have to see that whole entire ball out of the end zone. The official does a really good job. He does not make a decision. He's just stopping the clock. He's going to conference with his crew to see if anybody has any additional information. All right, so when in doubt, kill the clock, get information from other crew members. If this official was 100%, that whole entire ball came out, he would have came out half yard out, sprinting in with his arm up. So good job of giving your preliminary judgment of safety, but not making the ultimate signal until getting more information from other crew members. We see this a lot, dead ball officiating, and the officials are looking down at the spot where they're going to next place the ball. This is a good example of dead ball officiating. It is more important to get that spot in your head and continue to officiate the players out of bounds. Turn your whole entire body. Chest to the players is going to help you dead ball officiate. And if you have the need to get even closer to the players, you're going to see him drop his beanbag there for the spot. Now you can leave the field of play. The beanbag has your spot. You're going to go and separate the players. So good job dead ball officiating, turning, getting between players, and that beanbag is down um, for the next spot. So people always ask me, you know, what's a starburst? Uh, before every game at halftime, the five officials, they get to the middle of the field. A lot of people say, hey, what are they doing? Sometimes it's a prayer. Sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes it's reminders. Um, every crew has their own thing. But the big thing here is you send the message, we're ready to work. All right, so to begin each half, to begin the game, um, it's always good to break the middle of the field in a starburst fa uh, fashion where the referee is going to be running to the goal line, the umpire to the 20, the H to the 30, line judge stay at the 50, back judge to the 40. Just looks sharp. Again, sends a message of professionalism and we're ready to work. All right, so we're caught at the A35. Now the question is, what's going to be the forward progress spot? By rule, the forward progress spot is where the offense gets the ball under their own power. So, yep, the quarterback did throw it to the 835, but you have the receiver under his own power run backwards on his own, and that's where the defense then initiates the contact. All right, so the forward progress spot is no longer where he caught it because the receiver under his own power continued to run backwards. So this was a good job by the covering official uh, of Ford Progress Spot, not giving him the spot where he caught it, but where he ran back to and then where the defense first initiated him. So good job there. All right. How many times have we seen this? Both the offense and defense move, and now we have two flags on the play, one by the headlinesman and one by the line judge. Um, whenever we have two flags down, we can never assume we have the same foul. One flag is behind the defense. One flag is behind the offense. So now that's telling me as a coach, as an observer, um, as a fellow partner on the field, we have two different judgments here. All right, so two flags. Get together and talk with each other before you make a preliminary signal and before going to the referee. I'm going to rewind it a little bit. I'm going to go slow motion here with this clip. All right, so you definitely have the defense move first, but the defense moving is not a foul. Defense is not in the neutral zone yet either. We have the offense moving, simulating the snap before that defense enters the neutral zone. This is a false start. Um, as a crew, when in doubt, if it's so tight, the offense knows the snap count. Put it on the offense for a false start. All right, so the crew did get this call correct. They did come out of it with a false start. Uh, but a lot going on here. Slow down. Don't be in a hurry. First contact at the A33. Driven backwards. We see this a lot with newer officials. 
All right, so we have the official here at the bottom of the screen, A33, because that is where that first contact happened. That was the forward progress. We have the official on top of the screen going back where he was driven backwards and then hit the ground. The correct spot is where that running back was first contacted. So as a line of scrimmage official, we need to know where were they first contacted. Don't focus so much on how far were they driven back and where did they actually truly get tackled. The forward progress spot is where they got to with the ball under their own power. All right, so the crew did a good job here with the snapper protection. Referee's given the circle. Then the umpire's going to match it, letting everybody know that kicker's at least 10 yards, and the defense cannot run into the snapper. All right, so we have a foul during the kick, a block in the back at the A37. Very important when you report your foul to the referee, you have to give the status of the ball. So this is during the kick, which now in the referee's mind is going to be PSK, Post Scrimmage Kick Enforcement. And you're going to see the back judge throw a beanbag to give you that post scrimmage kick enforcement spot. So here comes the flag. Kick ends at the A29, position number one, hash mark nearest the press box. We're going to let this play out. There's the uh, beanbag from the back judge for the PSK, post scrimmage enforcement spot, end of the kick. And now we have the end of the run at the A36. All right, so we have an enforcement spot, end of the run. We have an enforcement spot, block in the back. We have an enforcement spot at the end of the kick. That's why it's important to give the referee what was the status of the ball when the foul occurred. Since it was during the kick, enforcement spot here by a foul by the receivers during the kick is from the end of the kick as so long as the run ended in front of that enforcement spot, which it did here. All right, so th this is the crew talking about where are we enforcing this foul from. You see the confusion. You see the uncertainty. We have a correct call of block in the back. But our body language as an officiating crew, when we don't enforce it efficiently, clearly, correctly, you could see now how the perception of a crew could sort of go backwards just a little bit. All right, so, you know, the old adage is if you can't enforce a foul, don't throw the, throw the flag for the foul. I, I don't believe in that because you have a crew for a reason. We have to be able to communicate as a crew to get the enforcement of the penalty correct. That's why the five of us are, are out there. However, when you have a flag, you might not know all the enforcement, but you have to give all the information to the referee to give to the crew and sort it out with clarity and confidence. So again, just a reminder, this foul should have been enforced from the end of the kick, PSK spot. Um, if you have time after watching this training video to review PSK fouls, it's rule 1043 in the rule book. Good pregame topic, always go over once or twice throughout the season, because if you have a strong kicking game with officiating coverage, you're going to have a great game overall as a crew. Another question we get is, h &L, when should I go downfield? When should I stay at the line of scrimmage? And sort of the teaching point is when your key makes it 10, sometimes 15 yards downfield, that's when you're going to want to release. All right, so we have the L, his key is at that 10-yard mark. He's going. The H, he, his key really isn't at 10 yards right now, so there's no reason for him to go. He's going to be able to officiate catch, no catch, inbounds, out of bounds within a 10-yard belt. When the players start going farther down than 10, now we need to start moving downfield here. 
And this is why. All right, so now he is in better position. He is officiating with his feet. And when the most critical part of this play happens, he gets set. His eyes are looking at this catch, no catch. So good job moving downfield. When your keys went downfield, great job getting set. So your eyes are set when the most important part of this catch, no catch takes place. Stays back so he doesn't get too close to the play. Once again, safety is important to have quality of officiating. Now we have clock is stopped because it's a first down. All right, high school rule. The initial direction determines forward and backwards pass. So when in doubt, we're going to call it forward. That way if he misses it, it's incomplete pass. So when in doubt, wipe it out. When the initial direction is backwards, you want to punch it backwards with an open arm and a closed fist. And you want to keep it backwards until that ball is possessed or recovered. Again, it is a signal. People don't believe us when I say this. When that ball hits the ground, so many people look at that official, look for that ruling. Was it a backwards pass? Is it loose? Can everybody pick it up for a fumble recovery? All right, so get into practice, H and Ls. If that ball's past your direction, if the initial direction is backward in Federation rules, punch it backwards and keep it punched backwards until it's possessed on the catch or possessed and recovered if it remains loose. All right, so we're Nebraska fans here in, in Nebraska, and you see officials cross their arms, and, and no, it's not, we're not throwing the bones. What the officials are actually doing is we have to cross two stakes. One stake, two stake for a first down. So that is what officials are doing when they cross their arms with the next number of down. It's a reminder of, hey, we got to go, go across two stakes. Because if we don't remind ourselves that in a game, there are going to be plays like this where that official will be stopping the clock because he just passed one stake. When we pass a stake, it's a first down, not on double stakes. All right, so that's just a reminder. If we have to pass two stakes for a first down, we do the cross our arms. That way we do not inadvertently kill the clock when we're not supposed to kill the clock. What's a training tape video without a potential blindside block here? All right, so here's the here's the little play we're looking looking at. So now the question is, was it blindside? Was it not blindside? And what determines blindside again is does the player see the block coming? And from this video angle, we're looking straight on. I can't tell if the player in green sees this block coming or not. All right, that's going to be the official's judgment on the field. They have the best judgment of that on the field. But what we need to know, we know that this player did not lead with open hands. He led with the shoulder. All right, so we know it's a blindside block. Now we got to have that judgment of did that person receiving the block see it coming or not see it coming? Okay, so outside the vision of the blocker, leading with the shoulder, illegal blindside block. That's the, the judgment of the official because here comes the flag. All right, so now important. Enforcement spot. This is a live ball foul. Yes, did the offense gain a first down before the penalty? Absolutely. Did the end of the run happen ahead of the penalty? Yes. So the all but one. All right, so we can't enforce this from the end of the run because the foul took place behind the end of the run. So this in this uh, penalty enforcement, we're going to go to the spot of the foul. Illegal blindside block is a 15-yard penalty. We go back to the spot, including the position, which is position 5, 15 yards, and it's going to remain third down. So, yep, it was third and 10. Now it's going to be third and 13 because they gained these many yards legally. Now we got to back them up. So just because they got a first down clean 
the live ball foul, the penalty enforcement for the live ball foul is still part of the play. We do not move the chains here on this um, on this play. It will be third and 13 at the 839. Once again, officials, when you're reporting the foul to the referee, status of the ball was during a run, so it was being controlled. End of the run was the 35. We need to go back to the spot of the foul. We're snapping at the 10. H and L, anything at 10 and in, we want to get ahead of the play. And if that ball, in your opinion, is going to get near that goal line, you have to be at that goal line, pylon extended, get to the position you need to get to before you need to get there. So boom, get ahead right at the snap. Get ahead of the ball. Because if you don't get ahead of the ball, you're going to be out of position. So when we t talk about officiating with your feet, all right, we didn't officiate with our feet as a L. We did officiate with our feet as the H. Um, so you want to be at the goal line here at this moment as the ball's going the pylon. We got lucky. Sometimes it's good to be lucky. All right, so it's a clear touchdown. Um, no body part is down, and the ball is extended inside the pylon. So this is ruled the touchdown correctly, um, but this training tape clip was talking about 10 and in, H and L. Get ahead of the ball. Once you get that feel that it's going to be goal line, get to that goal line extended. They're not all going to be that easy. So crew did a good job here. Okay. All game long, they've had a right-handed kick, right, right-footed kicker, and they noticed they have a left-footed kicker now. So the referee got on the O2O, -O, official to official communication, got his crew in the proper position. Not a bad thing. When they bring in an extra kicker, a different kicker like this, get your crew in position to officiate the play. Yeah, it might have taken five extra seconds. But that five extra seconds to put us in a position to officiate the play correctly is going to be well worth it if a crazy play does happen. So good job recognizing the lefty kicker and then changing your crew to get in the correct position. So we are snapping at the 20 and in. So I believe this was a mechanic change in 2022 where the back judge is starting way back on the in line when we're snapping at the 20 and in. But back judges, do not forget... 10 yards forward is still a lot closer than 18 yards forward. All right, so, yep, we're at the end, end line in case there's a pass play. We need to officiate the end line. But if it's a long run play for a touchdown, we also have to be prepared to get to the goal line. Here's a run, goal line. Great job by the back judge recognizing that that goal line is their responsibility. Coming up to 10 yards, and he's there before the ball carrier gets there. So good awareness, good positioning. That does it for training tape week number one for NFHS. Um, we are going to continue doing this training tape each week during the regular season. If there are specific clips of high school football that you would like feedback on, whether it be mechanics, signals, judgment, penalty enforcement, don't be afraid to reach out to Time Out with PSOA in our YouTube channel. Um, leave a comment with this training uh, tape video um, or contact us at PSOA at PremierSportsOfficials.com and we'll be able to answer as many questions as clearly as we can um, and, and with the intent of informing of what's proper, what's the proper mechanic, what's the proper signal, what's the proper rule, what's the proper penalty enforcement. So thank you once again. Week one training tape in the books. Uh, make sure you visit our podcast, Time Out with PSOA, at any place you have podcast uh, recordings to listen to. Um, we're through Heard At Media. So have a great week. Enjoy Friday Night Lights for week number two.